For 250 years, a little stone schoolhouse has stood proudly in Philadelphia. In that time, thousands of students have graduated and looked back fondly at the place where they grew and learned. The grounds have changed, the buildings improved, the teachers come and gone, but the heart and soul of Germantown Academy remain strong and true. What could we possibly have in common with the students and faculty of 1759? From the first recorded GA grad to the class of 2010, the school has always heralded a tradition of fostering the scholar, athlete, and citizen in every individual. The growth of Germantown Academy parallels the growth of America. Never behind the times, GA has pushed progress and frequently moved ahead. But well before we were innovators and educators, we were simply breaking ground on Schoolhouse Lane in Germantown. On December 6, 1759, in a small stone building called the Green Tree Inn, concerned neighborhood parents met to discuss the education of their children. With only the best interests of their children at heart, the Germantown Union School was founded. Those determined citizens waste little time purchasing land on Bensell's Lane, hiring Christopher Meng as the planning designer and laying the cornerstone for construction in 1760. On August 11, 1761, school opened to 131 students in the simple schoolhouse that they promised would always be used for education. As the small school in Germantown tried to settle into quiet routine, political unrest in the 13 colonies escalated. In 1774, the ship carrying the school's new bell from England was turned away in Philadelphia's one and only tea protest. The bell did not roost in the now iconic belfry until 1784. During the Battle of Germantown, the campus was caught in the crosshairs. Bullet scars are still visible on the weather vane perched atop the belfry tower. Academy buildings served as a temporary hospital for wounded soldiers. And on a more frivolous note, our campus played host to the first game of cricket on American soil as British troops awaited their orders. But past the war and into the uncertainty of new America, the Union School of Germantown kept its purpose aligned with the needs of the community and school soldiered on. Germantown was named for the large immigrant population of the time. Founded in 1683, this area had seen a large influx of German nationals gathered at the encouragement of William Penn. To address the needs of the community, the school was divided into English and German departments operating alongside each other with separate masters respectively overseen by Quaker and German board members. In 1784, the second master of the English branch of the school, Pelatiah Webster, secured an official charter for what would henceforth be called the Public School of Germantown. Remarkably, while a headmaster at GA, Webster found time to write the treatise used as a guide for the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The yellow fever epidemic of 1793 sent Philadelphia residents and institutions, including our young national government, fleeing to the surrounding towns and countryside. George Washington, then president, retreated to Germantown where his cabinet met in buildings which would become part of our school. Shortly after these visits, his adopted son enrolled as a student. By 1796, the name Germantown Academy was officially inaugurated, and all throughout Philadelphia, the Academy was known. The sturdy sound of the school bell echoed across Germantown each morning, calling boys to class. The daily routine in the 1800s consisted of chapel, classes, and a bit of free outdoor time. In 1821, the science department was founded, a few short years later, General Lafayette was a guest on campus and enjoyed the company of students and faculty. In the 1800s, a series of short-lived headmasters came and left. Enrollment dropped to around 60 students. During these years, the school was highly experimental in its methods and even at one point, dissolved the position of headmaster in favor of a teacher committee 
reporting directly to the Board of Trustees. Bronson Alcott joined the administration of the school in 1831 and incorporated an early learning program encouraging girls to enroll alongside boys, a valiant but short-lived effort at early co-education. His daughter, Louisa May, was born right there in Germantown. In 1860, Germantown celebrated the 100th year of the school with a parade and local festivities. Only a year later, GA students joined the Pennsylvania Bucktails in the Union Army of the Civil War. The school was torn in controversy. Germantown, dating back to the 17th century, was at the heart of the whole anti-slave movement. When Lincoln was assassinated, uh, GA was greatly affected, as was most of the North. Eventually, the colors red, white, and blue for the school were changed to red, black, and blue in memoriam for Lincoln dropping the white color. With his appointment as headmaster in 1877, Dr. William Kershaw launched a golden age of development on the old Schoolhouse Lane campus. Enrollment surged to 125 boys. Pap Kershaw was a born leader and father figure, and his influence over the institution was profound. And he really believed that school was more than just academics, that boys, some boys would be great scholars, but most would not. But they could have, they could be people with, with good character, leaders in their own community. And so he brought sort of the, the sense of GA spirit into, into the school life and made the school a, a, a place of community uh, for the boys and for their families. Germantown was still country well secluded from the bustle of the city of Philadelphia. The self-contained nature of the area ensured that everyone in Germantown had some association with the school and that it was very much a community institution. Under Dr. Kershaw, the school day began at 9 a.m. to a roll call, Bible readings, and announcements. He brought in guest teachers to teach such specialties as penmanship, drawing, ornithology, and botany. The great variety of subjects led Dr. Kershaw to make a plea to the board for a proper library. Kershaw also opened the doors to athletic development. His visionary assistant principal, George Hartley Deacon, championed the belief that athletics strengthen character. By 1878, the Germantown Academy Athletics Association was established, and GA fielded its first football team. Deacon initiated the founding of the first inter-academic league in the country, which included GA, Penn Charter, Haverford, and Episcopal. In 1886, GA and Penn Charter played their first football match. Only a few years later, Kershaw hired the school's first full-time coaches for football, baseball, cricket, and track. Before Deacon, only cricket and an early form of baseball, called rounders, were played by academy boys. The first red, black, and blue uniforms were worn by the cricket team in 1883. GA students had used the YMCA or the Germantown Cricket Club for athletic facilities. But with the Interac underway in 1887, the first Germantown Academy gymnasium was built and the first all-school field day took place. A few years later, Kershaw encouraged another significant addition to school life. The first recorded play was performed in April of 1894. The enthusiasm and community support for the performance led to the cry for an official troupe and the December Academy Monthly announced the formation of the Belfry Club of Germantown Academy. I've only been at Germantown Academy for six years, but I've inherited a program that has been in existence since 1894. The Belfry Club at Germantown Academy has been putting on at least one show a year every year since then. It's the oldest high school drama program in the country. I am thrilled to be part of a school where the visual and performing arts are such an integral part of our children's everyday lives and are so enriching to the community as a whole. Dr. Kershaw also oversaw the formation of the first alumni society in 1886. 
he made great efforts to connect former graduates and elicit financial support for athletic equipment and academic supplies by demonstrating the vast improvements on campus. Growing school pride was palpable, and the graduating students initiated the tradition of dedicating a class stone. I'm a graduate of 1959, and the class stone has been in the making uh, for our group for, for many years. And finally, with the 50th anniversary, it is, uh, it's come to a resolution, and we're, we're now offering it to, to Germantown Academy. During Kershaw's oversight, enrollment skyrocketed to nearly 300 boys, more than tripling what it had been when he started. But this success strained the small campus. Dr. Kershaw appealed to the board for construction of additional space, writing, if through lack of room and equipment we are not able to meet the increasing demands in science work, then Germantown Academy must give up its proud prestige and become a second-class school. Our purpose has been first, last, and all the time to make the Germantown Academy boy a highly toned, honorable gentleman. And with all our might and ability, we have striven to accomplish this result with whatever material has come to this school. And when I am asked what our success has been, I point with pride to the alumni of GA. As transportation improved and the world grew smaller, rivalries with neighboring schools became more tangible on campus. GA's evolution as an institution came in direct response to its changing student body. In 1915, William Kershaw retired and Samuel Osborne took over as headmaster. Germantown was now a bustling, populated area, easily accessible from Philadelphia. The small community that had formed GA was no more. Osborne's first act was to raise academic standards, a move unpopular with students but well-liked by teachers. It was a successful strategy that gave rise to greater numbers of boys going on to college each year. With the advent of the First World War, Osborne initiated an optional military training program on campus quarter of the student population elected to be involved. At the end of the 19th century, from the Spanish-American War on, GA was sending boys to the front. Um, there was a unit that was put together of uh, a significant number of GA grads in the Spanish-American War heading down to Cuba uh, with Teddy Roosevelt. And then, of course, in World War I and in World War II, uh, we had a significant portion of our classes and the class of uh, 1940 was particularly affected in signing up for the war after their graduation. In 1925, the construction of Moore Hall, donated by the family of an alum, allowed the school's capacity to increase to 400 students. Plans for a complete campus overhaul were in discussion. Tuition was raised and enrollment was at its maximum when the stock market crashed in 1929. In the next few years, the effects of the depression were felt as the school went into deficit and the number of students dropped significantly. Philadelphia suffered along with every other major metropolis during the Great Depression. In the first year of the depression alone, Philadelphia had 12,000 homeless, which was a huge number. Fairmont Park was filling up very quickly. Germantown Academy's uh, campus was in the heart of all that. The death of Dr. Kershaw admits the downturn was deeply felt by the GA community. The Kershaw Medal was established in his memory and is given out each year to students who exemplify scholarship and good character. During these difficult years, the nomination of Owen J. Roberts, class of 1891, to the U.S. Supreme Court was a source of pride for the school. Most notably, he made the deciding vote in the minimum wage law and upheld the New Deal. Osborne's retirement in the late 1940s heralded a period of uncertainty for the school. His leadership was missed and the effects of World War II were felt by all. Families moved out to the suburbs and enrollment dwindled. By the 1950s, the limitations of the little campus on Schoolhouse Lane were evident the classrooms, facilities, and grounds available to GA students 
allowed no further growth as the board acknowledged. Miraculously, the generous Robert McLean offered an enormous plot of land in Fort Washington with fields, forest, and a winding stream. It seemed that the time was right for a campus move. Robert McLean was my landlord in the early 50s, and we got to know each other, and I was surprised one day. Uh, I was no longer his tenant, but I had bought land from him, and we lived nearby. And he called me up and said, Bob, I have 160 acres on the other side of Sheaf Lane, which I would like to give to a school. And I have no particular interest in which school it is, just want to bring a good school out here. In return for his land, McLean had asked only that Germantown Academy become co-educational. On December 6, 1958, exactly 199 years after the founding meeting was held in the former Green Tree Inn, the board voted to move to Fort Washington and educate boys and girls alike. GA would grow from six acres to 160. No longer limited by its facilities, GA could become a truly modern, independent school as reflected in the depth and rigor of its curriculum. We then started to work on the project, which was all well and good to have the land, but they had to have buildings to have a school, and that was a long process. Uh, and uh, we all had to work very hard because we had no money. The, uh, Project went out for bids. I think it was uh, something between a million and a million and a half. Uh, we had negotiated with the, uh, with the builders to get it down to that level, but we didn't have any money. We just had a lot of hope and expectation. Slowly but surely, alumni pledged donations. A mortgage was secured and grounds leveled. The new cornerstone was laid on October 9th, 1960. Many challenges remained. Numerous proposals were rejected and buyers considered for the original campus. The Redevelopment Authority of Philadelphia secured a million dollar deal with the Lutheran Church. However, the Lutheran School was short-lived and the plot soon reverted to the Redevelopment Authority. In 1984, it became home to the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Alumni and, and many of the trustees had strong ties to the old campus uh, bond memories there, so it was a wrench for them to go to the new site, but uh, ultimately I think they were all pleased that they made the decision that they did to come out here, come out to Fort Washington. The original school building was deemed a national landmark, never to be dismantled, and a replica was built in Fort Washington. During construction, the Germantown campus remained active. In the fall of 1961, the new Lees Hall was ready. The lower school opened its doors to boys and girls. The last all-boys class of 28 graduated in Germantown in 1965. As a matter of ceremony, the board met one final time in the building that was the Green Tree Inn. They held a moment of silence and farewell to the Germantown campus. When we did get out here in the fall of 1965, it, it was somewhat of a circus, only because the building wasn't completed. The main building was not done. And we really didn't have the windows in, and the ceiling tiles weren't in. The only, the only electrical outlet was a light bulb over the, the uh, Harkness table that we had. And, you know, we would have rainy days. The rain didn't come in, but it was close to coming in, kind of splattering on the, on the window sills, but no windows. And it was dark in the rooms. So you can imagine one 60 or 100 watt light bulb hanging over the, uh, the Harkness table. Um, so it was quite a different teaching environment from what we were familiar with down in, in Germantown. In June of 1968, a class of 34 boys and 17 girls graduated from the Fort Washington campus. It quickly became the largest private day school on the East Coast, with long waiting lists for enrollment and nearly 1,000 students. In a few years, Germantown Academy's interior school space grew from a mere 25,000 square feet to over 100,000. 
plagued with construction bills, the athletic department would have to wait until an anonymous donor gave $80,000 to flatten and build the fields, the track, the tennis courts, and a bridge to connect the academic buildings to the sports fields. In 1965, the school hosted a field hockey championship and proudly displayed its new fields to the competition. In the 70s and 80s, women's athletics exploded everywhere in the United States and Germantown Academy followed suit. We started with five girls varsity teams in the early 70s and now we have 13 varsity teams. We have 84 teams now competing in 18 different sports with the boys and girls in our program. In addition to more traditional athletics, Germantown Academy boasted teams in golf, fencing, ice hockey, and gymnastics. The new facilities inspired the Patriots to thrive. A lot of memories here. I was here since seventh grade and just, I just remember the first time I came to visit. It was, it was a whole nother world. And just me stepping on this campus and just seeing all the students and just seeing a different atmosphere from where I was from, that memory itself is something that I'll never forget. I had great teammates. I had teammates that let me be the player that I could be and helped me be the player that I could be and just that whole environment. The student body was supportive of the team. We became, we became a good team. We start winning more. That experience at GA basketball I just is irreplaceable. And I, just, I, would, I will never forget those memories here playing for GA. With the building of new swimming facilities and hiring of a new coach, GA ensured its place in the national record books. The pride and respect that the school and the athletic program instilled in me from a very young age was a tool that I had that I was able to carry through all the way to today. And um, whenever I'm in a situation where I am introduced as a member of the GA community, it's something that I am very excited to tell people and um, proud to tell people and I owe the GA community a debt of gratitude for giving me those tools and allowing me to have these experiences. Bud Cast was appointed headmaster in 1970 to make GA a model institution and destination school. By naming Ginny Day our first Dean of Girls, he gave Girls Issues a real voice in the administration and transformed GA into a fully co-educational school. And Mr. Cast and Mrs. Cast, who is also very influential in her work with the arts at GA, are the ones who really developed GA as we know it today. In many ways, Mr. Cast is this era's uh, replica of, of Dr. Kershaw. Uh, he came in, and there were plenty of students here, but the school was kind of adrift in the 70s, trying to figure out where it was going, and, and led us in a direction where we expanded the curriculum, and he looked at this campus and said, the one thing we're missing is a strong arts curriculum. And to me, and I've said this many times to people over the years, that was the missing piece for Germantown Academy. And when the arts came in as strong as they did in the 1980s, that made us a complete school. Because of the enormous popularity of the school and its prime location, there were gnawing demands almost immediately in Fort Washington. The remarkable donor Edwin Lavino made possible the gymnasiums, the pool, the dining room, and later on, the arts center. The emphasis on visual art, music, and performance was unusual at the time and garnered much support as the students thrived with the new studios and practice rooms. My very first memory of the Media Lab at Germantown Academy was actually touring it as uh, a, an eighth grader, uh, looking, you know, to come to Germantown Academy to start in the ninth grade, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. You know, it was, that's what I distinctly remember about GA. It had this ginormous swimming pool, and it had a place where you could make movies, which for high school seemed mind-boggling, but I, I knew exactly that's where I wanted to be. Just to have a place, a safe place where, where kids could experiment, you know, with cameras and music and, and recording, and um, definitely that was uh, the foundation for, for setting the framework of what I, what I do today. Part of the reason I went to GA, I, I remember very distinctly, was just walking into the theater, you know, when my parents were trying to figure out where to send me. I got to act every day at GA, and that, that, was, that was really important for those years in, in the middle when I didn't know what it is that I was, you know, was going to do. And then the Patriots came along in, uh, when I was a junior, or the, you know, the new, newest incarnation of the Patriots, and I really, I'm really thankful uh, that, that 
those programs were there in the capacity that they were. I don't think it was till after I graduated and went to, to NYU that I realized sort of the type of background that I came from and how lucky I was to have experienced all these different facets because I mean, you had kids that were going to the Olympics from, for sports, you had kids that were going to different colleges immediately for arts or for science, you had all, I mean it's basically proof that kids really were exposed to so many different things to be able to sort of specialize and narrow down what they may want to do that early on. Once again, new facilities proved a muse to student talent. Participation in visual arts, music, and drama skyrocketed. The theater provided an ideal setting, not just for student performances, but to host distinguished speakers and guests for the entire community. The foundation in the arts that Germantown Academy provided at that young age is, is unrivaled in my opinion, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, and I'm, I'm happy to know that it continues to flourish in such a wonderful way. Teaching was the center of Bud's vision for GA, strong faculty. So he and Jack Pickering, his assistant head, really recruited top-notch teachers, gave them lots of freedom to teach as they wanted. Uh, and out of that era came this, uh, this time of sort of legendary faculty members and a, and a very strong, very strong arts program. 1990, Jim Connor, who worked in the development office, was called down the hall to take on the mantle of headmaster. As a proud father of two GA girls and a key player in building the school's endowment, it was a stewardship he gladly embraced. Germantown Academy has always been, and certainly in my experience, was a highly creative environment where one was given the opportunity to think outside the box, to think of different ways to uh, present an understanding of the subject matter that was being presented, whether it be in uh, an English course or even a language course or even in a mathematics course or a science course. All of these were opportunities for us to learn how to express ourselves in different ways. In a way, GA almost, I don't want to say over-prepared me, but it, it prepared me incredibly well for Brown University and beyond, to the point where there are a lot of, you, you don't realize until you're there that the GA is essentially from ninth grade on is teaching at a college level, certainly at a community college, if not an Ivy League level, and you don't necessarily realize that. But then when you go to these classes, you say, well, I already, either I already learned this or I already learned the techniques to master this. In more recent years, Jim Connor has spearheaded the innovative Community Partnership School in Philadelphia, bringing Germantown Academy's proven model for educational success to yet another community wanting the best schools for their children. We really began to see the value of real early childhood education. It's reflected in the Partnership School and it's reflected here at Germantown Academy too. In the 90s, we really built the modern pre-K program we have. We started the daycare center. And I'm tremendously proud of that, starting with the Partnership School and continuing now with our work with schools overseas. We want to focus on strengthening who we are here in Fort Washington, but also develop a bigger reputation in, in the outside world. We're just beginning. I mean, this, this program is just beginning. And this can be one of the best schools in the world. And I believe that with every, every breath I take, and that's why I've stayed here. Not because I think I can take it there, but because it's taking itself there. And it's, it's, it's really exciting to be a part of this journey and to share it with colleagues and friends and trustees who have made it this way. Germantown Academy's outlook is bright. With a 250-year history of triumphing over adversities great and small, GA can confidently look forward to its next 250 years. The community is the consistent pulse of our school, providing a continuity of character from our past to our future. Happy birthday, GA! Happy birthday, GA! Happy birthday, GA! Happy birthday, GA! Thank <laughs> you.
Steve Snyder, class of 56, happy 250 to GA. Uh, how you doing? This is Alex Towns, class of 78. I'm here with uh, my own coach, friends, guys I used to look up to playing football. It's a great time here, 250th year. Go GA, BPC. Happy birthday, GA! Jeff Whitaker, class of 88. Always glad to be back for GAPC Day, especially in the uh, 250th anniversary year. So cheers to GA. Happy birthday, GA, from the class of 2004. All of my years at Germantown Academy were wonderful, and uh, to come back to the academy is coming back to family and friends, and I love it. Thank you. Happy 250, GA! Hi, this is Bill Gross, class of 88. Just wanted to wish GA a happy 250, and many, many more. Hi, I'm Brad Corman, class of 1983, with my son Sam, class of 2016. And we are very excited to be here. We wish GA a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, GA. Happy 250th. Happy 250th birthday, GA. Yay, go GA. Hillary Baker and Resna Devan Brunson. Class of 1979, wishing GA a wonderful 250th anniversary. Happy 250th, GA! Mr. Schulberg, it's always a pleasure. Love you guys. Love, Love you guys. guys. <laughs> Happy birthday, GA. Happy birthday, GA. Happy birthday! Thank you. 